thank you again for joining today's discussion on securing a non-toxic work environment. Katie, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our panelists and lead the discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Tracy, and I'm the Workers' Rights Policy Analyst at the Center for Progressive Reform. Uh, we, we do have two other panelists joining us uh, who I want to introduce quickly. Um, we have Joe Santarella. Uh, Joe is a co-founder of Santarella and Eckert LLC, and he'll be sharing his expertise on suing employers using citizen suit provisions in federal environmental laws. Uh, we also have Mike Shade joining us. Uh, Mike is the Mind the Store Campaign Director at Safer Chemicals Healthy Families, and Mike will lead our discussion about advocacy opportunities beyond the workplace including successful market-based campaigns. Um, before we hear from Mike and Joe, I'm going to start us out with an overview of uh, the scale of the problem with unregulated chemical hazards at work, and then tell you about a new guide that CPR just released last month uh, called Chemical Detox for the Workplace, a Guide to Securing a Non-Toxic Work Environment. First, I wanted to share some of the, some of the statistics that help illustrate how problematic chemical exposures are. Um, every year, more than 50,000 lives are lost to diseases caused by on-the-job chemical exposures. In fact, that's more people than die every year from opioids, firearms, or car crashes. So another alarming statistic that I wanted to share with you is that according to a United Nations report that was released earlier this year, around the globe, a worker dies every 30 seconds because of exposure to harmful substances at work. And of course, the problem of occupational disease is not limited to chemical plants or chemical manufacturing. Um, in fact, workers are at substantial risk of chemical hazards across dozens of sectors, including agriculture, uh, hair and nail salons, domestic cleaning, home repairs, and building construction. And I mean, the list just goes on. And despite federal laws that are supposed to protect workers, the problem persists. So agencies like OSHA and EPA encounter serious obstacles when developing workplace protections against toxic substances, even when they have overwhelming scientific evidence of the significant health risk. And although there, you know, there are well-intentioned career professionals at OSHA that are dedicated to addressing toxics at work, OSHA is plagued with problems. Uh, one major obstacle that the agency faces is having a very limited budget which makes it incredibly difficult for them to move forward with new rules, uh, yet alone enforce the existing ones. Um, some other serious barriers at OSHA include constant political and industry interference, uh, too few inspectors, and maximum fines for violations that are so low that they can't possibly serve as effective deterrence against employers who put their workers in danger. So for those of you who are familiar with this challenge, you know that these problems are new to this presidential administration. Uh, they've you know, been going on for a very long time. But the Trump administration has actively sought to make a bad problem worse. Um, some of Trump's first acts as president were to delay enforcement of OSHA's newest chemical exposure limits uh, for silica dust and for beryllium. And since taking office, Trump's OSHA has abandoned plans to adopt exposure limits on other chemicals as well. Uh, Trump has also repeatedly proposed to slash the Department of Labor's budget and has proposed to eliminate the Chemical Safety Board. And Trump's EPA has continued the attack on, on chemical protections and the agencies that um, administer those protections including by trying to undermine the 2016 overhaul of the Toxic Substances Control Act, which requires that EPA, among many things, evaluate the risk that certain chemicals pose to human health, to workers, and to the environment. And instead of seizing the opportunities of TOSCA reform, the Trump administration appointed Nancy Beck, an American Chemistry Council lobbyist, to serve in the EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, uh, which many of you know is the office that's tasked with performing EPA's work under TOSCA and other federal environmental laws. So not coincidentally, uh, since Trump took office, EPA has allowed new chemicals onto the market, despite their significant health risk, and has halted an earlier proposed ban by the EPA itself um, on the commercial use of methylene chloride. 
Uh, not to mention that in addition to the risks that we know of, one, one area where we have not even began to explore the risk and understand the, um, the health impacts is the uh, impact that climate change will have on workers' health and safety uh, and, and how chemicals might factor into that. So th the problem is a large one, and we see that workers need some tools to address chemical hazards without waiting for OSHA or EPA to take action. So with the hope of putting a dent in this very large problem, I joined with three of CPR's member scholars, uh, uh, Tom McGarity, Sid Shapiro, and uh, Rena Steinzer, to design a handbook uh, outlining 11 potential strategies for advocates and workers. Um, the guide also includes an overview of the applicable federal laws for addressing toxic chemicals and a long list of the best available resources that we could identify for helping find information on chemical hazards and find information on how to take action. Uh, there's a link on your screen now where you can uh, access the guide, uh, read it or download it if you're interested. Um, so uh, the next thing I just wanted to do was to briefly tell you about some of the strategies that are in the guide. Uh, before I talk about those, though, I did want to reiterate that employers should be the ones that are taking these actions so that workers don't have to. But of course, we know that's not always the case. So that's why we wanted to provide strategies that workers can um, utilize. So an another um, tip before, we, before I move on to talk about the strategies is that we do recommend that workers reach out to their union representative if they have one or to a worker center or advocate in their community. Um, you know, most of the time, workers are not going to be alone in their concern, and, and others uh, may have already done useful research or may be able to connect those workers with others who are already taking action. And additionally, uh, unions and worker centers have tremendous expertise on addressing chemical hazards in the workplace, uh, so we want to be able to utilize all of our available resources. Um, so one of the first strategies that we recommend in the guide is for workers to exercise their right to know about chemicals they encounter um, by learning about the chemicals they're being exposed to and whether the exposure can be limited or completely eliminated. Uh, in the manual, we include, uh, as I mentioned before, a long list of resources that workers can use to help identify the chemicals and uh, the hazards involved. Um, and once workers have identified the dangerous chemicals in the workplace, we recommend that they work with their employer to reduce the chemical or switch to safer alternatives. Of course, though, this is not always possible. Not all employers are receptive to these kinds of changes. Um, so if a worker feels that their employer has failed to provide them with the correct information or ha failed to provide training or has violated a chemical standard, uh, they can file a complaint with OSHA, and that's a strategy that we explore in the guide. Uh, in addition, if a worker believes that an environmental law was broken uh, because, for instance, uh, the surrounding community was exposed to a chemical hazard, for, um, for example, then workers can also submit a tip to EPA, and that's another strategy that we explore in the guide. Um, one other tool we talk about in the guide is the right to refuse hazardous work. Uh, while workers do have a limited right to refuse hazardous work, Satisfying the elements required to exercise this right is difficult, and it's rarely accomplished. So we talk about the advantages and also the disadvantages to that approach in, in the guide. Uh, another strategy that we explore in the guide is citizen suits. Um, under the OSHA Act, workers don't have a right to file a private lawsuit against their employer to enforce the law. Um, however, as Joe will talk about more in a moment, uh, many environmental laws do allow for citizen suits which means any member of the public can sue an establishment for violating an environmental statute. There are also other legal avenues for addressing worker exposures, uh, such as through filing for workers' compensation, filing a toxic tort lawsuit, or even contacting a lo local prosecutor about pursuing criminal charges. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on those now, but those are three other strategies that we do explore more in the guide. And then beyond any specific workplace, uh, workers and members of a community can help to improve safety by engaging in advocacy initiatives. Uh, for example, they can get involved in pending legislative initiatives or market-based campaigns. And one prominent and successful example that we do highlight in the guide is the effort by families and advocates to convince retailers to remove toxic paint strippers from store shelves. 
Uh, Mike will talk more about these initiatives after we hear from Joe in a moment. Uh, so before I turn it over, I just wanted to conclude by saying that while our guide doesn't cover every issue or situation a worker may face, our goal is to assist advocates and workers with identifying the appropriate questions to ask, initiating research on chemicals of concern, and collaborating with other workers, unions, and local organizers to take action. So I'll leave it there and I'll turn it over to Joe. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Santorella. As uh, Katie had already mentioned, just to briefly give you a background, I am an environmental attorney. I have been uh, representing labor unions and environmental groups since I left EPA as an enforcement attorney back in 1996. I spent six years, six and a half years at EPA as an enforcement attorney under a variety of different programs and have a number of perspectives from that. Another place where I have perspective is I've been teaching an environmental compliance course for the last 20 to 25 years since I left EPA. It's another one of my efforts to try to foster compliance. One strategy, of course, is to compel compliance to enforcement actions. The other is to provide training and insights and perspective to the industry to help them understand the importance and the benefits of compliance. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to move forward and talk about my presentation and various aspects of uh, the strategies that you can utilize. I note in first instance, if you look at this slide, that I have also identified some of the strategies, some of the concepts that Katie's touched on. Before I jump into my presentation, I want to reinforce a couple of basic points that Katie made and touched on at least to some degree. The first is one of the benefits of environmental laws opposed to OSHA or MSHA requirements is that indeed environmental groups and individuals and workers have the potential to file citizen suits. In essence, to act as private attorneys general and bring suits where the federal or the state government refuses to go forward. Remember that most of these environmental statutes, or at least the uh, big three, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Resource Conservation Recovery Act were passed in the 1970s when, like today, there was a certain amount of distrust and concern about the executive and whether they would indeed adhere to the laws. In this point, the concern was that they would actually enforce these environmental requirements and to ensure that they did not become paper tigers or paper lions that actually weren't enforced, citizens were given the right to enforce these requirements if there was a lack of diligent enforcement at the federal or state level. So that is a very powerful tool. Instead of simply petitioning OSHA or MSHA and asking and waiting for them to act, perhaps a, uh, a rather fruitless effort in this circumstance with our current administration, we are able to go forward and enforce these requirements ourselves. The second point I want to make is that typically EPA establishes standards that are significantly more protective than OSHA or MSHA would do so. Under the benzene decision, OSHA has been told that if they establish protective standards that protect to one to the negative third, 1,000 cancer risks, that they are indeed doing their job. And in, we've seen in the past that that number has been fudged. In contrast, we know that EPA typically seeks to establish standards and permits that protect from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6, protecting cancer risks somewhere between 1 in, one th one in 10,000 to 1 in a million. So as a knee-jerk reaction, when you talk to EPA toxicologists, when you work with EPA officials, they're typically looking to establish more protective standards than OSHA or MSHA would do so under their regulatory authority. Finally, the last point that I want to make is that uh, Katie talked about the civil penalties under OSHA and MSHA being relatively low. Civil penalties under these environmental statutes are robust, particularly after the initiative, the, both the statutes and regulatory changes that have pushed the agency to uh, make civil penalty adjustments on an annual basis. So we see that the $25,000 penalties that are included in the statute have doubled, tripled, and even gone further than that in many circumstances under those two, the statutory and regulatory authority. So let's jump into the slide number two. My basic point here is that there are a number of different strategies that can be utilized. You can look at environmental permits that are out there, whether it be Clean Air Act Title V permits, whether it be a waste analysis plan under RICRA that would give you insights into what is being produced and what is being stored at the facility, and you can use the permitting process to push for less, uh, more, less hazardous chemicals being used at the facility. 
enforcement proceedings. I've already talked about the prospect of citizen suits, and Katie touched on the idea of lobbying federal and state agencies to enforce environmental violations. I had a lot of success with that in past administrations, not so much these days. There's also debarment and suspension from federal contracts and grants. That may give you leverage to get changes at the facilities. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act both include provisions that would result in a facility being suspended or debarred from participating in federal contracts and grants, and certainly that's something where you can get a uh, company's attention and effectively generate leverage to effectuate change. Moving on to my next slide, if the cooperate with me. We see, the, again, outlining various opportunities for worker participation and digging in a little deeper. Remember that environmental permitting and review requirements allow you to access significant information from the facility. It also allows you, as I've already said, to look at the facility operations and figure out ways to push the permitting to uh, spur the use of less hazardous chemicals and processes that will pose less risk to workers at the facility. One point that I want to reinforce, notwithstanding the rhetoric that I've received from some uh, EPA officials recently, the Clean Air Act Risk Management Plan Program, the RICRA statute, both include a general duty clause, a general duty clause that tells EPA that they have a responsibility under the statute and the regulations to protect the workers at the facility. There are times where the agency takes the perspective that workers at the facility are solely the province of OSHA and MSHA. Frankly, that's bunk. And unfortunately, under this administration, they're moving back from that mandate, and I was specifically told just last week that the agency lacks the regulatory authority to protect workers at facilities that are being exposed to persistent bioaccumulative toxins that are being generated at the facility. Bunk. But that's also the reality that we're dealing with right now. Remember that these programs, especially the big three, are delegated to individual states. There are some states that are taking more aggressive approaches, and it might be worthwhile to reach out to them or coordinate and work with them under the circumstances. Finally, there's also local environmental land use and zoning requirements. That may indeed give you leverage to address potential risk to workers at the facility. Remember, not only when the facility is operating, it also may be appropriate to weigh in as the facility is being built to make sure that it's built in a way that effectively ensures that it will protect workers at the facility as well as the surrounding community. Other strategies, briefly touching on them, submission of public comments under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, or Environmental Permitting Review. Again, I mentioned Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and RICRA as opportunities to do that. Recognize that there's also options for judicial and administrative appeal under NEPA, uh, particularly when the agency utilizes the fast-track environmental assessment approach. They issue FONSIs, or Finding of No Significant Impacts. Those findings of no significant impacts effectively establish enforceable requirements that may be a base is for you to create a cause of action as well as to argue an arbitrary and capricious decision making. And then my last bullet re reinforces the potential to file petitions to reopen per permits and invoke other regulatory authorities uh, based on new information. One of the most powerful tools that I have touched on in working with these facilities over the years and working with labor unions is recognizing that the workers inside the facilities know that facility typically better than the regulators. And therefore, they have information that can be brought to bear either to garner the cooperation of regulators or to go forward and present uh, challenges and violations that have not been uh, raised by the regulators and, and they may not be aware of it. So remember, the workers are a tremendous source of power in these circumstances. Touching on, again, these various strategies outside of construction, uh, citizen suits recognize that NEPA, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, Clean Air Act 112R, as well as EPCRA provide numerous opportunities for worker participation. I'm peeling back the onion a little bit here and going into some detail about these programs. I want to reinforce, for example, that EPCRA 304 and Circular 103 are both established emergency reporting obligations. There is significant overlap there, and you may find that they've reported for one and not the other. You may find that they haven't reported for any of that, but TRI information or other documentation gives you insights as to what's going on to the facility and allows you to pull back the curtain and have a better idea of what's happening at the facility to allow you to hold them accountable. Continuing on worker participation strategies, the RICRA, as I mentioned, uh, 
large quantity generators as well as treatment storage and disposal facilities have to have waste analysis plans. Those waste analysis plans will identify every chemical that they're using and disposing of that, at that facility. Powerful information. TOSCA 8C has health reports. EPCA 301 to 303, there's emergency response coordination information that will be at the first responders, also should be at the facility. 311 and 312 of EPCRA. 311 requires safety data sheets to be provided to the first responders, and 312 upon request requires Tier 1 and Tier 2 reports that tell you where these chemicals are located and at what volumes. And then finally, 313, which is the annual use of these chemicals, whether it be manufactured, processed, or otherwise used, gives you tremendous insights of what's happening at that facility. What I've found over the years is that if you take these various documents and you put them next to each other, Often you can find gaps. They've reported for chemicals under 311 and 312 by providing a Tier 2 report. You look at that and say, wait a second, that chemical is also a Tier I chemical. They're not reporting under the Tier I. Wait a second, that's a risk management program chemical. How come they don't have an RMP? These are ways that we can get a better idea of what's going on, and a lot of this information is publicly available. For example, rtk.net provides copies of the RMPs as well as providing information about TRI reporting. That's maintained by the Houston Chronicle right now. In addition, there's a significant amount of information that's available on the EPA website, including, it's almost like, like I know what the next slide is going to say, the Environmental Enforcement and Compliance History Online Database, also known as the ECHO Database. The first thing that I do when I target a facility is I go to the ECHO database, I put in the zip code for the facility, and then I pull that facility up and I find out from EPA and the state whether they believe that this facility is in compliance and uh, what uh, media programs they're potentially in violation of. So, again, lots of public information that's available. If that information is not readily available on site, uh, on the Internet or other public documents, I remind you, there we go, that EPA has broad information gathering authority. This broad information gathering authority often results in the agency making information requests. Sometimes they don't act on those, that information, and when they don't act on it, it's created opportunities in the past. For example, under President George W. Bush, uh, the agency decided not to enforce new source review violations. Various environmental groups foiled those information requests got the results of those information requests and went forward with citizen suit themselves. So remember, particularly in an era where the agency is not moving forward aggressively with enforcement, that may, create, that may create opportunities for you and there may be data and information available at the agency that you can utilize. Let's focus now for just a few minutes on the, fo on the focus of my presentation, citizen suit enforcement of environmental violations to protect worker health and safety. As I mentioned, workers as well as the community members, typically re represented by an environmental group or an environmental advocacy group like Earth Justice, bring citizen suits that effectively enforce violations that the federal or the state go government has not acted upon. There is also the ability for these environmental groups and citizens to bring suits against the federal government where they are not meeting their mandatory requirements to implement programs. But here we're talking about where there's a violation of a, at a facility, including potentially a facility that is operated by the federal or the state government. There are certain jurisdictional requirements for bringing a citizen suit, as my brethren from Earth Justice certainly are aware of. Foremost is establishing standing. Now, one of my frustrations and, and my complications in giving this presentation is I've been allotted all of 15 minutes, and uh, I could probably go on for a couple of days about these topics. So I have to watch myself and I have to watch my clock and want to make sure that I don't uh, <clears throat> deliberate too long about these issues, but we will have some questions and answers afterwards. I would like to answer your questions then. I'm also available after the, the presentation, if you'd like to give me a, talk, a call and we can talk about any of these issues on a more specific and individual basis. So standing requires that the organization or the plaintiff establish organizational and individual standing. And um, at the risk of running roughshod over it, in essence, we have to show that there's an individual in the facility that will be injured, in fact, by the lack of enforcement or by this violation.
We have to show that the organization's interests are simpatico or similar to the interests of the uh, statute. But by and large, standing is an issue that turns on whether we can establish injury in fact. We also have to file a notice of intent to sue. Notice of intent to sue is intended to provide the, the alleged violator and the federal and state government with information as to what we believe to be the violations at the facility. But here's the rub. Case law indicates that there, the detail of a citizen suit notice letter has to be greater than a civil complaint. We have to make sure that we specifically identify what regulatory provisions were violated, when were they violated, who violated them, where were they violated. We want to make sure that we have those specifics in place, and then typically we're required to sit on our hands for 60 days. Why? To give the federal or the state government the opportunity to jump in front and bring that enforcement action instead of uh, the citizens. Now, if you note, I said typically. New source review violations and certain other violations, 60 days notice is not required. You can go forward with the suit immediately. However, I've seen that practitioners typically wait 60 days, whether it be to be conservative or whether because there are other uh, alleged violations in which 60 days notice is required. In any case, moving on, I've already touched on the fact that there needs to be diligent prosecution. Uh, and that diligent prosecution can effectively uh, strip a citizen's group of jurisdiction. From my standpoint, that doesn't concern me overwhelmingly. We still have an opportunity to intervene, although it may impact your ability to recover attorney's fees. Moving on, a couple of basic concepts now that we're in the citizen suit or in our environmental campaign, campaign and trying to push the regulators uh, to take action and trying to push the facility to protect the workers at the facility. Basic concepts and ideas. One, if you have a facility that's violating labor standards, that's violating uh, other requirements, whether it be SEC or like, you will typically find out that they're violating environmental requirements also. And that's what the unions have found in the past, effectively found out that when co companies are violating other standards, there are often environmental violations that can be addressed. So I encourage you to identify and develop relationships with the stakeholders, develop relationships with the regulators, obtain and review the documentation in permits and corporate documents. We found documents in SEC filings that were useful in identifying when a facility was constructed and therefore what standards under the Air Act and other programs are applicable. In addition, uh, there are other documents that you can obtain, as I've mentioned, through FOIA and the like that can effectively address your concerns. Moving forward, so we compile evidence, identify permit gaps and environmental violations. We use st federal and state FOIA requirement, uh, authority to get more information. We identify and leverage the power of workers in the community to, to bring this information to bear and effectuate change. We lobby federal and state regulators. We submit comments, initiate citizen suits against alleged violators where we identify alleged violations. Again, our strategic considerations of potential options have got to establish standing. We've got to be aware that we may be dealing with a slap suit, strategic litigation against public participation. We've got to recognize that timing is important. We make sure that we bring the lawsuit within the statute of limitations time period. We make sure that our timing effectively protects the worker and it resonates with the regulators. We also recognize that there may be bias or public opinion against workers participating in environmental matters, and we need to be ready to explain to them why it's appropriate for workers to be involved. Why? Because workers are members of the communities, because workers are the first involved. On my lapel, I always wear a pin with a canary inside of a car, a cage, and it reminds me that the workers are the canaries in the coal mine, and they are the first one to experience the risks, the exposures, and the harm that results from environmental releases. Rules of the road, no trespassing. We why with all the laws when we go forward with these actions, we don't brag, we don't gloat, we don't make threats. We don't enter into economic, in, into coalitions with economic competitors. We don't block access to decision makers. We raise only valid environmental claims. That's how we protect ourselves from slap suits. We reinforce the nexus between workers and environmental compliance. We reinforce the nexus between environmental violations and worker health and safety. 
and you make sure that you hire experienced environmental counsel that knows how to bring these lawsuits and doesn't walk you into a slap suit or walk you into a uh, claim for damages. Obviously a shameless plug. With that, I'll remind you, though, it's not that shameless of a plug anymore. I'm going to be wrapping up my legal practice within the next couple of years, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here right now. I want to make sure that the uh, work that I've done, that the, the strategies that I've developed are shared with others so that this important work can go forward as I move forward with my environmental training. One last point. One of my favorite musicians, Todd Snyder. If you know the song, you know I've taken a little bit of liberty with it. He ends it with the point, if worms had daggers, birds wouldn't mess with them. Well, in my world, the workers are the worms, and I'm trying to arm them and make sure that the birds, companies, owners, regulators don't mess with them and that they can fly and live another day. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Again, if you'd like to discuss these issues with me further, there will be a question and answer period. And also, you have my contact information on the slides. I welcome any follow-up calls that you may have. Good luck to all of you. In solidarity, Joe. Thanks so much, Joe. And we'll turn it over to Mike. Um, <clears throat> Great. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Terrific. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, join the webinar today. So uh, again, my name is Mike Shade. I work for Safer Chemicals Healthy Families, and we lead national coalition of organizations that work to, get, work to safeguard American families, consumers, workers from toxic chemicals and everyday consumer products, uh, which can pose significant hazards to workers uh, that make these materials, chemicals, and products. So I'm going to talk about our work <clears throat> uh, to challenge leading corporations to uh, get toxic chemicals out of the marketplace, and I think that we'll talk a little bit about how this can be used as a strategy to protect workers from toxic toxic hazards on the job. So, provide a few case studies that provide, hopefully will provide uh, some ideas for inspiration. So, we launched the Mind the Store campaign six years ago to challenge the nation's largest retailers to get tough on toxic chemicals, and we think retailers can play an important role in phasing out and eliminating chemicals that can pose serious hazards <clears throat> and risks on the job to workers, either workers who manufacture these chemicals or materials or workers who use these chemicals on the job that buy them at retail or <clears throat> workers that may be exposed to chemicals uh, when they're uh, disposed of, when they reach the end of their <clears throat> useful life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of case studies uh, for those of you in the labor community, I'm sure you're very aware of the dangers of methylene chloride. This is a chemical that is a, a carcinogen. It's a chemical that has killed uh, dozens of workers over the year, over the years. <clears throat> Under the newly formed uh, Tosca reform law that was enacted a couple of years ago, US EPA proposed to ban uh, <clears throat> methylene chloride and N-methylpyridone and NP in paint removal products under the authority granted uh, by them under the new law uh, methylene chloride is quite dangerous to workers. Uh, since 1980, there's been at least 64 workers or consumers uh, that have been killed from working with uh, methylene chloride-based paint removal products, and uh, particularly in enclosed spaces and places like bathrooms, bathtub refinishers, for example. Uh, NMP is also quite hazardous chemical. It's a developmental and reproductive toxicant. poses severe risks to uh, women of childbearing age, uh, pregnant workers, so recognizing that the US EPA under this administration may not do uh, its job, we launched a campaign uh, to challenge large retailers, companies like Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and others to use their market power and leverage to phase out the sale of these uh, deadly and dangerous products. Uh, since the US EPA had proposed banning these two chemicals a couple of years ago, there's been at least four workers or consumers uh, who were killed uh, from using these products. So we uh, launched a campaign partnering with other major environmental groups like NRDC, uh, as well as the parents of victims of young men who were killed from working with these products. And I think this provides an example of the power that we have to challenge corporations to be more responsible and to phase out and eliminate chemicals that can pose severe risks and dangers to uh, workers as well as consumers. Uh, over the course of a year and a half, we sent letters to retailers, and um, as we found that Lowe's and Home Depot were dragging their feet, we launched a campaign 
targeting Lowe's, encouraging them to be a leader on this issue, particularly because we were contacted by a family uh, whose son was killed uh, working with a methylene chloride-based paint removal product on the job. He was a small business owner. Uh, so we launched a petition to Lowe's uh, that you'll see in the top left there that was signed by over 200,000 people across the country. We uh, generated media attention, calling on Lowe's to act. We organized protests, media events, picketing outside of Lowe's stores across the country, the National Week of Action. Uh, we partnered with other major, major national groups like the Learning Disabilities Association of America to urge Lowe's to act. Uh, U.S. Kosh Network uh, named Lowe's as one of the dirty dozen employers for selling these products that killed uh, one of their customers. And uh, the final thing we did in the campaign is we were planning to attend Lowe's annual shareholder meeting. We were planning to deliver the 200,000 plus petitions that we had generated. We planned to deliver them to the CEO. And we also planned to bring victims, uh, family members who had lost their sons uh, to speak and confront the CEO at the shareholder meeting. And it was that the threat of us attending the shareholder meeting that pushed Lowe's over the edge. And I'm proud to share that last May, just about a year ago, Lowe's announced uh, that they were the first major U.S. retailer to commit to phase out the sale of uh, paint strippers containing methylene chloride and NMP in all of their stores, not only in the U.S., but in Canada, Mexico, uh, other markets. And you see here some of the press coverage in the New York Times and USA Today. Uh, and we give credit to Lowe's for stepping out to be the first major retailer to act. Uh, we immediately turned to their competitors and said, hey, if Lowe's could do this, you could do it as well. Uh, we already had a petition uh, targeting the Home Depot that was up on the web. And when we were talking with the Home Depot, they said that they were really concerned that if they stopped selling this, that their customers would just start shopping at Sherwin-Williams. So we uh, turned to Sherwin-Williams and we said, hey, if, you, if uh, Lowe's can do this, so can you. Sherwin-Williams made the same commitment. Uh, I see here my, my animations are not working. So uh, this is a, a slide that shouldn't be seen as it is. But Sherwin-Williams made the same commitment about a month after Lowe's. And then in the months following, the Home Depot, Walmart, in total, 13 other major retailers uh, made commitments to phase out the sale of paint strippers containing methylene chloride and NMP. And it's worth noting that almost all of these retailers committed to stop selling them, not only to consumers, but also to professional contractors. Uh, and it's worth noting that some of these companies like the Home Depot and Sherwin-Williams, uh, a lot of their customers are professional contractors. So these retailers stepped out and committed to protect not only their uh, DIY consumers, but uh, professional contractors and other workers. Uh, and I think this is emblematic of the type of change that we're trying to achieve in the marketplace to leverage the power of retailers to drive hazardous chemicals out of products to safeguard workers and consumers. And these 13 retailers uh, are now have pulled these products from over 30,000 stores across the US, Canada, Mexico, and worldwide. Meanwhile, uh, this has created enough political pressure uh, combined with other advocacy to push EPA uh, to move uh, sadly, though, EPA announced just a couple months ago that they were going to move forward, finalize the ban on methylene chloride at retail, but only for consumers. Uh, the flip side, though, is that if a retailer sells even one paint stripper to one single consumer, they also have to stop selling it for all of their customers. Uh, despite that, the new rule that EPA announced, because it doesn't sufficiently protect uh, workers, we and other organizations, like Earth Justice, NRDC, a Latino labor organization, as well as uh, some of the family members of young men, we have now taken the Trump EPA to court under Tosca. We filed a suit against them and we're um, pushing EPA to move forward and finalize the ban, not only protect consumers as well as workers. Another example of a chemical that we've uh, worked on to uh, aim to phase out and ban and hold corporations accountable to protect workers is uh, TCE or trichloroethylene. Uh, this is a chemical a solvent that is uh, uh, like methylene chloride, chlorinated solvent. It's used for uh, cleaning industrial equipment uh, used in, a, in what's called a vapor degreasing process. It's also used in uh, it's also used dry cleaners, uh, super nasty chemical 
Uh, EPA has found that it can be really uh, dangerous for uh, women of childbearing age, for infants, for fetal, uh, for, for babies. It can uh, link to serious adverse effects on babies' hearts. It's also linked to cancer and other serious effects. So like methylene chloride and NMP, EPA proposed banning these chemicals uh, under the newly uh, reformed TSCA law a couple of years ago. Uh, according to the EPA, an estimated 45 to 100,000 workers are potentially exposed year end and year out. And uh, these, this chemical poses severe risks to workers. So what we did is we actually um, aimed to uh, survey uh, large facilities that, as Joe was talking about, uh, report the use of this chemical under the toxic release inventory chemical. And we looked at chemicals that likely use TCE for vapor degreasing based on their industrial codes. And we sent them letters and we said, hey, are you using this chemical? Do you plan to phase it out? How are you going to phase it out? Are you going to switch to safer alternatives? And that survey revealed and helped put pressure on companies to begin to move towards safer alternatives, uh, disclose whether or not they were moving to alternatives that are demonstrably safer. Uh, unfortunately, though, for most of the companies that we wrote to and surveyed, uh, they either disclosed that, uh, that were, they had moved to a regrettable substitute or were not searching for an alternative or did not even respond to our repeated inquiries. And uh, sadly, the US EPA has still uh, not move forward to ban this chemical. So this is an example of a chemical that we think needs more pressure on industry and the EPA to move forward and restrict. And if you're interested, you can download this report that we published on our website. It's called, it's called Toxic Vaping. Another example of an effort we pursue to challenge corporations, particularly retailers, to phase out chemicals is been putting out an annual report card that grades and benchmarks retailers on their chemical policies or lack thereof. Because there are thousands of chemicals of concern that are out there, as many of us know. So we found that by publicly benchmarking companies on their policies or lack thereof, this is helping to pressure a large universe of retailers to step up and improve. No one wants to get a letter grade of D. No one wants to get a letter grade of F. And by publicly grading retailers on their policies or lack thereof, that's helping to pressure them to uh, to improve and to create what we call a competitive race to the top. As evidence of that, within one year of putting out our first report card, seven out of 11 major retailers that we evaluated announced either for the first time ever significant new safer chemical policies, like in the case of the Home Depot, Costco, Best Buy, and Albertsons, uh, or in other examples, companies like Target, Walmart, and CVS significantly expanded their uh, approaches to chemicals management by announcing new efforts to phase out chemicals of concern like phthalates, parabens, formaldehyde, and things like cleaning products. So by publicly benchmarking and grading retailers, this is putting pressure on these huge giant corporations to take action and phase out chemicals that can pose significant risks to not only consumers, but to the workers that uh, manufacture these materials. Uh, since we put out our first report card, we've continued to expand it. This most recent one we put out in 2018, uh, which is on the web at retailerreportcard.com, we've graded 40 major retailers across 12 key uh, retail sectors where chemicals of concern are commonly found. And we're challenging these big corporations to use their market power and influence to reduce and eliminate the, the worst of the worst chemicals Across, their supply, across global supply chains to safeguard workers and consumers. And the good news is, again, this is continuing to work by publicly grading and calling attention to these companies, by uh, calling attention to the laggards, this is putting pressure on major retailers to improve. Uh, as evidence of that, just this past year alone, for the first time ever, Amazon, Rite Aid, and Walgreens announced new chemical policies to phase out dangerous chemicals like phthalates in their supply chains. On the flip side, far too many retailers remain serious laggards. Uh, I think about six companies in our most recent assessment received letter grades of D, and 19 out of 40 companies received letter grades of F for failing to meaningfully address the chemical safety of products in their supply chain. And we're now calling on huge companies like these to step up and improve, to protect consumers, to protect workers from hazardous chemicals and the products and packaging 
of the products that they sell to protect workers, consumers, and communities. And you can go to our website at retailerreportcard.com, share the report, you can send tweets to the companies, uh, and you can also send emails to all 19 of these companies, urging them to improve to meet the rising consumer demand for products that are safer and healthier to protect consumers and workers. Uh, with that, I'll close. And if you're interested in getting in touch, uh, here's my contact information. And again, encourage folks to uh, visit our website at retailreportcard.com. And if you're interested in getting involved in the campaign to hold other big retailers accountable, uh, here's my contact information. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. This is Brian Gum again. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to uh, leave the slide up with Mike's contact information for just a few moments um, while we move into the question and answer period. Um, to minimize background noise, we're going to keep the lines muted and we ask that you type your questions into the chat box on your screen. Um, so Joe, I, we had an earlier question from Fernando Tapia asking, uh, among the agencies that you've worked with, have you worked with the Department of Transportation as well? I have not done a lot of work with the Department of Transportation. The work that I have done in the transportation realm would be with pipelines. Uh, they're typically, they may be considered uh, transportation facilities. Certainly the agencies treat them as such in, for example, a 404 program. But the short answer is I have not worked specifically with uh, the Department of Transportation. I don't consider them to have regulatory responsibility other than the responsibility that they take on when they uh, advance a project or support a project and then have various regulatory requirements that are imposed from various other re regulatory agencies. So the short answer is no, I haven't worked with the Department of Transportation. I see them as an agency that has to comply with these regulatory requirements as opposed to imposing them. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, a uh, couple of related questions for both of you, so I'm going to kind of combine it into one question. Um, and that is, have you worked with unions at what sites in what parts of the country? Um, you know, what have your experiences been with, with working with those unions? Mike, do you want to go first or would you like me to? Uh, you can take the first shot and I'll add to it, yeah. Well, um, Dorothy, my practice or our practice is largely union-based, and I represent a number of different labor unions. The bulk of the work that I've done in a health and safety standpoint using environmental laws has been with the United Steelworkers. I've worked with the United Steelworkers on more than a half a dozen different campaigns for over 20 years, typically seeking to hold them accountable under the Clean Air Act and other programs where we've raised concerns about the workers and the communities being exposed and seemingly finding chronic violations. Other unions that I've worked with, I've worked with the National Metals Trade Union. That was an effort to uh, keep the Avondale shipyard from being shut down outside of New Orleans, identifying some of the problems with closing that facility and the risks that are incumbent to that. I have worked with building trades throughout the United States, in particular in the Gulf Coast and most significantly in the Colorado Rocky Mountain region. We've looked at pipelines. We've uh, looked at a number of different projects, including Clean Air Act permits, uh, trying to figure out ways to make sure that the facility does not uh, generate hazardous air pollutants and that in the process of developing cleanup strategies or um, pollution control equipment that you don't end up putting the workers at risk. For example, when um, you try to address emissions uh, sometimes if you're trying to address SOX and NOx emissions that may pose risks to the environment, you may use uh, selective catalytic reduction that requires a fair amount of ammonia to be maintained on site. Concern from the worker standpoint is while you may be addressing the air issues, are you creating untenable risk by virtue of the amount of ammonia being stored at the facility and there are other strategies that can be utilized. So I have used a number of work with a number of different uh, labor unions. The bulk of the work that I've been worked with is the industrial arena, and that's with the United Steelworkers. Mike? Yeah. Uh, we, you know, as I mentioned very briefly in passing in the beginning, uh, we were founded 
as a national coalition to safeguard American families from toxic chemicals. And uh, many, there's a number of key unions that uh, are part of the coalition that we work very closely with in the, in the fight to uh, advocate for comprehensive reform of our nation's broken chemical safety system. So we've uh, enjoyed a great partnership with the steel workers, uh, as well as other uh, labor unions. Uh, we have worked with many uh, labor leaders and labor allies in the campaign to uh, ban the sale of methylene chloride and NMP. Uh, we worked um, mostly with the Kosh Network on that effort. Um, and more recently, as I mentioned, given that the Trump EPA is not doing its job to protect workers from deadly methylene chloride, uh, we recently filed a lawsuit against the EPA with not only uh, the moms of young men killed by this deadly chemical, but some other major organizations, including the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, uh, which is a national organization that represents the interests of uh, about 2 million Latino trade unionists throughout the U.S. and Puerto Rico. And um, I believe that they're represented by Earth Justice Center litigation against the, um, the EPA. So we do like to work with the labor community whenever we can. Um, you know, they're you know, sometimes where there may be instances where we're going after a corporation that the labor community um, isn't as concerned about, and then that, you know, that goes vice versa. So, but we do try to work closely with the labor community whenever we can, because we think that their interests or our interests and all these issues are so deeply interconnected. And so we, we like to work with labor whenever we can. And if folks have ideas on ways we can work with the labor community on some of these retail campaigns, I'm definitely... Um, all ears for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joe, Mike has a question about uh, what's the difference between Tier 2 reports and RICRA waste reports? Mike, thank you. I I'll get that money to you in a few minutes to help you <laughs> one up for me so that I can show some of my <laughs> yeah. knowledge. No problem. Um, basically, they're coming at things from different directions. So let me take a step back for a second and talk about what a Tier 2 report is. Under EPCRA 312, a company may be required to submit a Tier 2 report. What a Tier 2 report is going to tell you is what chemicals are being stored at the facility and at what volumes. Or more aptly, if EPA does the enforcement action, what vessels are containing chemicals that are for which a SDS, a safety data sheet, is required, right. and what is the volume in that vessel. EPA enforces like TSA does when we go through security with our shampoo bottles. They don't care how much shampoo is in the bottle. They care about what the capacity of that shampoo bottle is, and that's the same thing that EPA does. So our Tier 2 report is going to tell us what is located at the facility and what is the max if it's exceeded that threshold planning quantity uh, at the facility. When we look at RICRA waste reports, there are a host of different RICRA reports that we could look at. Uh, there is the biennial report that doesn't necessarily include a lot of information. That tells us uh, what has been generated at that facility over the last two years. There are manifests. Manifests give us a little bit more information, but again, it may not give us the specification that we're really looking for. What I like to look at RICRAs are the material profile forms that the generators submit before they give it to the TSDF facility. That will tell you what specific chemicals are in that waste and the percentages of that uh, specific chemical in the waste stream. So that can give you a lot of information that will tell you what's being done at the facility that would allow you, in essence, to backtrack and understand what's happening. So there are a host of different RICRA waste reports that are available out there, and what I have found the, the success in is taking these various documents under various statutory programs and putting them next to each other and asking myself the question, does this make sense? For example, we talk about giant cement in the CPR report. What happened in giant cement is we pulled out their RMP, the risk management plan, for the facility in Harleyville, South Carolina. And we found out that they were reporting an enormous volume of acrylonitrile on site. I believe it was something like 561,000 pounds of acrylonitrile were on site at any given time. 
yet this company was not submitting a Form R under TRI, which in essence said, we are not burning 10,000 pounds of acrylonitrile in our kiln in an annual year. Now, you go to their, data, go to their internet website, and they say that we burn 40 million gallons of liquid hazardous waste a year. You go to their RMP, it says we can have 561,000 pounds of acrylonitrile on site at any given time but they're not burning 10,000 pounds of acrylonitrile? Well, when we did discovery, we pulled up their material profile forms, and lo and behold, we found a number of generators that were sending a significant amount of waste to the facility that had identified significant concentrations of acrylonitrile in their, in their waste stream. That told us that there clearly was a mistake that was being made and that they were underreporting for TRI. So again, by putting these various reports side by side and understanding what their limitations are and what their information is, you start to get a snapshot and a picture for what's going on inside that facility to give you leads as to whether they're in compliance or in violation with various programs. Our next question uh, comes from Kirby Hughes, and it is, uh, TCE is a specific groundwater pollution problem in northeast central Denver but this may uh, not be from ongoing dumping or leaking. Um, Mike, have you worked uh, or investigated this problem with businesses, largely dry cleaners, and unions there? And if so, with what results? Uh, we haven't worked on that particular site, although um, I have uh, worked on other sites around the country, including here in Brooklyn, where I live, uh, uh, which I think is from is where uh, TCE is a major contaminant, um, so it's a huge issue because it can be a major problem of vapor intrusion where the chemical can migrate into buildings when it's present in the groundwater or soil. Um, if, you know, while I am not familiar with that particular site, I'm certainly happy to refer you to experts who have worked on other uh, TCE contaminated sites. Uh, like there's a guy by the name of Lenny Siegel, based out of California, who does a lot of work with communities around the country that are dealing with TCE groundwater contamination. I know mean, he maintains a listserv of grassroots activists around the country that are concerned about TCE, so he'd be a great resource to talk with. Another organization who might be able to provide some assistance is the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, CHJ, where I used to work. Uh, Stephen Lester there is their toxicologist, and he might be able to provide some technical assistance to you if you're looking, if you have technical questions about, uh, about that. So those are two folks that I would recommend connecting with about uh, a TCE waste issue. For us, we were working really to push EPA to, uh, to ban, this, to ban uh, the use of TCE for vapor degreasing, uh, which is a pretty significant use of the chemical. I think it accounts for like 14 or 15 percent of all uses. And of course, um, it's likely one of the reasons why TCE, when it's used in vapor degreasing, you know, companies may accidentally or purposely dump the chemical uh, and then it ends up into the soil or groundwater and then, you know, it becomes a super fund or RIPRA problem. Uh, but those are two organizations uh, that, and folks that I think could really be a real resource for you if you're dealing with a local TCE contamination issue. Again, Lenny Siegel, the Center for Public Environmental Oversight, and the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice in Virginia. Great. Um, I'm going to close out the question and answer period with a final question. Uh, this comes from Greg Sawinski, uh, and it's for any of you. Um, how does one deal with job blackmail barriers regarding toxic exposures and environmental contamination? Mike, I'll take a quick shot at it. Greg, that's a big issue. That is a big, big issue. Um, there is a tremendous amount of propaganda that's generated by the companies to try to convince them that, convince the workers that these are not risks and the, the employers use these strategies day in and day out. Um, about the only thing that I could say is a strong union and an effective training program where workers are able to get unbiased information on uh, 
particularly impressed by the United Steelworkers Mazaki Center and their adult training strategies where they turn the trainers, they turn the workers into the trainers, and they train themselves incredibly impe- effective and incredibly empowering training strategies. So from my standpoint, the best thing to do is train the workers, treat them like adults, and give them information, and empower them. Hey, this is Katie. I'll just add to that that, um, you know, a good place to start um, in addition to the Mazaki Center is uh, in the resources that are located in the guide that we just put out. Um, there's about 10 pages worth of resources for identifying chemical hazards in different industries, but also finding out about the risks and uh, different safer alternatives that might be able to help eliminate those risks. Yeah, I think you guys nailed it. Excellent. Um, We're now approaching the end of today's event. I'd like to thank our presenters and everyone in the audience for joining us today. Um, As you close out of the webinar, there will be a short survey available to you, and I would encourage you to answer that survey and provide us feedback. Um, And also, please remember that the webinar recording will be available soon. Thank you again for joining us for today's event.